Okay, welcome to the November 14th, 2022 Northampton City Council Legislative Matters uh, <clears throat> Committee meeting. I'm Alex Jarrett, I'm the chair, I'll be presiding. And um, it, so we'll call this meeting to order and Laura, if you could call the roll. Sure. Councillor Jarrett. Here. Councillor Elkins. Here. Councillor Moulton. Here. And Councillor Nash. Here. Um, so this meeting is being audio and video recorded and will later be posted to Northampton Open Media for anyone to view. Um, the we next will come to uh, public comment. And th this is public comment that uh, is for items that are not on the agenda. Um, so if you are here to speak for an item that is on the agenda, uh, then please hold for when that item comes up and then we will take your comment at that time. So is there anyone who wishes to speak on an item that is not uh, on the agenda? If that's the case, you can either uh, raise your hand using the reactions feature or you can turn on your video and raise your actual hand. Okay, seeing now. Okay, Linda, you have an, you wish to speak to an item not on the agenda? Right. Um, I did. I submitted a form today to extend the no parking zone to the left side of Perkins Avenue on Prospect Street. So, so that, I know yeah. that's at the end of the agenda. There's one for people coming out of Stoddard Street. Um, I live on the corner of Perkins and State, and so at the top of Perkins Street. I'd like to have that extended. I don't know if you can do that now or if that goes to a different meeting. So just to let you know. Um, that, um, you can... Sorry about that. Um, so the, if you would like, um, if you, you can either speak your comment now, if you can't wait for the the end, but that would certainly be something that is uh, close to that area. So we could we could take that up when that. Okay, I can comes. I can wait till the end. I can wait till the end. That's fine. Okay, great. Okay, so the next item uh, is the approval of minutes of the previous meeting. We have the minutes of September twelfth and October third, twenty twenty two. I would entertain a motion uh, to approve both of these. So, so moved. moved. Second. Second. <laughs> All right, there's a, there's a fight there. Uh, we'll give that to uh, uh, Count, uh, Marissa. Um, and I use first names unless anyone objects here. Uh, we'll give that to Marissa seconded by Stan. Any discussion? Well, I just wanted to point out what I regard as two Scrivener's errors in the uh, in the meeting uh, information on the September 12th meeting, that was not a joint meeting of the Planning Board and City Council mm -hmm. Committee on Legislative Matters. It was simply us. Okay. You see that? That you see the title there. I'll remove that. The reference to the Planning Board. Correct. And uh, the October 3rd meeting, uh, the time, uh, as noted when it was called to order, was actually 6.30, not 5 p.m. Whoops. What happens when you cut and paste? Yep. That's right. That's I'll right. It. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Stan. Any, any other discussion? Okay. Uh, roll call, please. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Elkins. Yes. Councillor Moulton. Yes. And Councillor Nash. Yes. So that passes unanimously. Next, we'll come to 22.191. Uh, this is an ordinance relative to parking on Main Street in Leeds. This was referred by the City Council on October 20th. And Director Lascalia, um, a DPW director, is unexpectedly uh, unable to join us today. So I spoke with the sponsor, that's Councillor Rachel Maori, and we agreed that the, the best course of action is to delay to our December 12th meeting. 
Um, so legislative matters has to has a 60 day reporting requirement and um, that so that, that 60 days would actually be December 19th. So our, our next meeting is within that 60 days. Um, and I've confirmed that the planning department director, Carolyn Nish, is able to come. I haven't heard back from Director Lascalia about the date, so there is a chance we would need to schedule a special meeting if she couldn't make that. But otherwise, uh, unless there's objection, I would simply, simply take no action on this item today and have it show up at our, our next uh, agenda. Uh, okay. No objection here. Okay. Then we will proceed with that. <clears throat> um, and we are on to 22.192. It's an ordinance prohibiting the use of wild or exotic animals for entertainment. This was referred uh, to us by the city council on October 20th. And um, I believe that the sponsors, uh, Jim Nash and Karen Foster are here today to speak to this item. So we'll, we'll hear from them first um, and any questions we have from committee members, and then we'll open this up to the public uh, to speak uh, about this item. So Karen and, and Jim. Well, I'll defer to Councillor Foster to open this up and since I'm on this committee, I'll, I'll weigh in a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> so, sounds good. Um, and I'll be relatively brief um, because we, we talked about this during um, our most recent city council meeting or two meetings ago. Um, but this ordinance um, came at the request of a constituent, Sarah Cate, um, who used to be a resident of Ward 2 and is, I believe, now a Ward 1 resident since the re precincting. Um, and she reached out to me after Amherst had passed a similar ordinance. And um, as, as mentioned, as we started to look into it, um, you know, originally there's a, there's a couple of reasons for municipalities to pass ordinances like this. Number one is the expressed purpose of the ordinance, which is to ensure that um, there isn't inhumane cruel treatment um, of wild or exotic animals um, going on. Another reason for a municipality to pass these ordinances as well is that the more that do kind of the, the more the market share for these kinds of acts shrinks. Um, and so, you know, it's, it just is one less place that these acts can come. So I was, I was interested to work on it. Um, and as mentioned, as uh, I reached out to Councillor Nash, and as we sort of dug in around Northampton to look to see um, if this may have impact um, or what kinds of impacts there may be in Northampton, um, it looked like the fairgrounds um, has in years past and you know, concerns through the pandemic and loss of revenue was considering using some acts that would have fallen under this ordinance um, into the future as well. Um, you know, a lot of times, you know, the acts that might have bears or lions, I, th I think several years ago, there was a shark exhibit. Um, it's really under this um, pretext of education, um, but it's, it, it's, it's a pretext. We, they say it's education, but at the same time, the animals that are being used for these acts, um, it, it's, it's very much entertainment and it's, they're out of their habitat. Um, the travel and training and confinement conditions um, are inhumane. And um, there's, there's really not educational, you can get educational value in many different ways that don't involve this kind of um, treatment of animals. Um, so Councillor Nash and I, um, had many meetings with the fairgrounds, um, you know, talked with them to kind of understand um, and, and make sure we were coming from a place really of collaboration um, with them and wanting the fairgrounds to be successful and at the same time to be, um, you know, with, with our rich agricultural heritage to respect that um, and appreciate that and allow room for that to grow um, while ensuring that wild and exotic animals weren't being driven and confined in captivity and used here in Northampton um, for an express purpose of entertainment. So that's sort of where that's gone. Um, you know, we, the meetings that we've had with the fairgrounds led to them not scheduling any acts this past summer that would have fallen under this ordinance. Um, there, um, you know, we've discussed language to be sure that um, the language of the ordinance um, does leave room for the horses and the oxen and um, I know Jim's very into grannies racing pigs, um, but those are um, those are all acts that will not be impacted by this ordinance. I'd also seen 
some social media talk, which always happens as things move forward, where there was some concern about Look Park. Again, Look Park uh, would not fall under this ordinance either. Um, so uh, this is a, it's a very targeted um, directed ordinance. Jim, I don't know if you have more you wanna to add to that? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, that in, in my view, you know, that um, we as a community have reached, you know, that, that we're kind of done with this type of entertainment and that- um, But it's cool that, for you to have pigs and horses. Uh, is somebody speaking? Um, it, that, um, that we're, we as, we as a um, community are drawing a line, which is that, you know, wild anima animals, getting animals to do things that they don't wanna do uh, by stressing them out, by uh, using uh, techniques that, you know, that uh, aren't typical of what we would use for training a dog or for training other animals to do things. Um, that this is very, it's, it's targeting animals that are outside of their environments, they're very stressed out, and that, um, and that it, 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 it is not um, a prohibition of any domesticated animals, that uh, the, um, the activities that uh, go on at the, at the fairgrounds, whether it's, you know, all, all of the 4-H events, um, the the grannies racing pigs uh, that will continue, um, and as as well as educational um, uh, activities that are related to um, uh, organizations that are that are rehabbing animals and that um, that that are not specifically um, uh, uh, breeding animals and and using them for wild animals for the purpose of entertainment. And um, so I, I think it's a case of, you know, that it's time for us to draw this line. I, I don't see a, within our community, a big draw, a big interest in this past type of entertainment. And that, um, and so I, I, I think this is drawing a line and saying, you know, this is, it's gonna stop here and we're gonna move forward. So, um, and the other thing I want to add is that um, that there there's been, you know, in social media and also in in some of the communications with uh, counselors via email. Um, so there's been concern about whether or not a a possum could be part of a um, an edu a educational. Um, opportunity. And that typically when, you know, so if it were um, uh, an organization that had rescued an animal and, um, and um, was legitimately rehabbing the animal, that, yeah, that could be part of an educational opportunity for kids. Um, but the we're not seeing the possum as being, you know, trained to do a particular act and, and be there for somebody's entertainment. Um, that, and that was, that's true of, you know, you know, many of the concerns that were raised. Um, there was the mention of camels. Camels are, um, and, and, it, and it's true that, in other parts of the rule, uh, world that camels are um, relatively domesticated and, and part of that different cultures, but they aren't typical of the culture that we live in here. And to have them brought here to perform particular acts, provide rides, um, and the same is true of elephants, you know, bringing them here to provide that kind of entertainment um, would be prohibited under this. Um, so, you know, it's allowing a lot of the, a, a lot of the things that we really want to continue in terms of prom promoting our agricultural heritage and education, those things are, are all allowed. And, and that's why we work so hard with the fairgrounds to, um, to uh, 
develop the language that you see here. Um, and so um, the the fairgrounds is 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 quiet on support for this, but I can tell you they appreciate being part of the 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 discussion around the language that's that's gone in gone on into creating this proposal. So um, that's what I have to say, and um, um, thanks for listening. And I I. I I expect we have some people here to speak both for and against it. So I turn it back over to you, Alex. Thank you. Yeah, Karen. Actually, can I add one, one thing to that real quick? Yes. Yeah, think, thanks, Alex. Thanks, Jim. Um, I did also just want to thank um, the MSPCA and the Humane Society. They've provided a lot of technical support around language and some questions that we've had. Um, and they're here tonight, Liz Magner and um, Kara Holm Holmquist from MSPCA and Laura Hagen from the Humane Society are here tonight in case there's uh, more technical questions um, for them as well. Great, thank you both. Uh, so we'll take questions from other counselors first and then we'll open it up to the public. Uh, any questions, Marissa or Stan? Stan, yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, so I. I I, I guess I want to ask uh, if uh, Jim and Karen, you feel that the 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 ordinance as written um, uh, cover sufficiently covers um, educational exhibits and lessons in um, elementary, secondary educate uh, schools. I mean, part three uh, lists uh, as a as a as an exception demonstrations or, or exhibitions by a college or university for educational research purposes. And I, I guess I'm wondering why you felt it wasn't necessary uh, in that section to include also um, elementary, secondary uh, grades. I mean, Jim isn't Karen, it a presentation? Take... Sorry, I didn't mean to. Yeah, Jim or Karen, do you want to take uh, answer that question? Well, I think it's referring to who's doing the presentation rather than who's um, receiving the information. But maybe we need to refine that. Well, I. Yeah, I, I... Oh, I was gonna say, yeah, my read on that, it's, it's um, you know, at a college or university, which, you know, we, we really would only have Smith here. And I've, I've reached out to Smith and haven't been able to learn if, if they have direct concerns related to this ordinance, but I, I'm not aware of them having any educational exhibits, um, and, but they would be exempted regardless. Um, as far as, are you thinking, Stan, about like exhibits that would be coming to an elementary school or something like well, that? I guess the one that I'm most familiar with, because he always gets publicity, is Tom Riccardi and his and his Raptors. And uh, I, I guess you know from the communications that I've received, um, there there's there seems to be uh, a feeling that um, that educational exhibits like that are, and because they're not specifically mentioned as an exemption in uh, in public uh, schools, uh, uh, that this might be uh, applied to them. So I, I just wondered why, when when you crafted the uh, the ordinance and and uh, and uh, you know uh, included section three, uh, you, you didn't also mention uh, the uh, public public schools. There, there are um, birds aren't included in this, so. We were thinking about the Raptor show and, and the Hawks and those are things that, that we're familiar with. Um, and I know Liz has her hands up, so I um, definitely defer to her expertise. But um, I think one of the things, one of the, the frameworks to work on shifting is there's very little education that's using wild or exotic animals. That's, you know, that often is said edu to be educational is often entertainment. So I think most valid educational purposes wouldn't fall under this, but Liz, or, or, I'm sorry, Alex, you're in charge of this meeting. I will stop. Yeah, you'd, you'd like Liz <laughs> to respond to that? <laughs> yeah. Okay, great. I will ask her to unmute. Go ahead, Liz. 
Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Liz, and um, I work at the MSPCA in Boston, um, and I'm really excited to be here. So uh, just to add a little bit to what the counselors have thoroughly covered in response to this question, um, there is the exemption for a wildlife sanctuary. Um, and there also is um, that very specific list of the animals that are covered by this ordinance. And I would just add that that list was put together um, very thoughtfully and very carefully. Um, and so probably the most helpful way to think about it would be looking at that list and, and thinking that these are the animals that would be covered um, as opposed to why aren't raptors listed specifically as an exception? Um, so for instance, you know, it covers um, all non-human primate species, but then when you're talking about cats, um, it, it, you know, says wild cats and then all species except domestic cats. Um, so, and then also I, in terms of um, shows at elementary schools, you know, I, I know that um, there's fairly commonly shows with like, uh, lizards or snakes or something like that. I, I remember that from elementary school anyway. And um, those animals would not be impacted by this ordinance. And um, lastly, I just wanted to mention that this language is fairly standard. Um, 13 other municipalities in Massachusetts have passed ordinances uh, very, very similar to this one. And um, it hasn't been an issue in any of those communities. Thank you. Dan, did that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I, I think the list does does cover it. Um, uh, and uh, I'm looking at the list again, and and I I don't uh, think that there's any um, conflict between the the prohibited uh, uh, animal species and what you would normally find in a uh, what you would find in a in a uh, in an elementary school or 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 a uh, a secondary school, so I, that's that satisfies that question. I do have one other question, um, and I think Liz uh, would be a good person to answer this. Uh, there's been reference uh, to the racing pigs at the fairgrounds, and uh, uh, one of my constituents in uh, communicating with me about this lamented the fact that the racing pigs would be no longer allowed. He was assuming that that was an act that would be covered by this, which it's it's not. And I, I wanted to ask uh, Liz, um, uh, uh, PETA has in the past objected to, to uh, racing pigs. Uh, the MSPCA, at least back in uh, 2003, I found a case involving a another fair um, in the in Eastern Massachusetts, MSPCA's position at least then was that racing pigs uh, were not considered to be a. Uh, uh, this was not a, uh, uh, a a violation of of this this kind of a, a, a standard. Is that still the position of the MSPCA? Um, sorry, could you just repeat the last part? Not a violation of. MSPCA did not agree with PETA that the racing pigs constituted. Uh, cruelty. Oh, um, yes, I would say, uh, unless we've stated otherwise, um, and I, to my knowledge, we have not, that that's still our position. And um, um, yeah, so as you know, those animals, the racing pigs would not be impacted by this ordinance. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I wanted to follow up on something that Stan brought up. So it's back to the any demonstrations or exhibitions by by a college or university for bona fide uh, educational or research purposes. That wouldn't, you know, it doesn't have to be on the grounds of that college or university by my reading. It, it, it just has to be what, you know, that, that they are the ones who are putting it on. Is that what your in, intention was? That's um, my intention. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. So you have an educational institution that is performing, you know, they're, that they're doing a service to educate people. Great, thanks. I don't I think they'll be showing up tigers, though. <laughs> <laughs> 
you know, that I, that, you know, possibly raptors, possibly, you know, um, uh, uh, animals that you might find locally that are uh, being rehabbed in some way. Um, so. Okay. Uh, Marissa. Oh, sorry. If you had another question, you can. No, go ahead. Um, I just wanted to uh, sort of reiterate that that is also how I read it, that I read it, that the presenters was had to be some sort of academic institution um, and specifically at the university level. Um, and I don't think that's unclear, but if anybody wants to revisit that, mm -hmm. um, this is just a little point um, that I um, in uh, section B definitions um three oh no wait where did it go two um defining traveling show um could we use um permanent habitat as opposed to residence it just is i just found it to be sort of an odd sort of anthropomorphization <laughs> um if that makes any sense it's a little thing i'm sorry it seems almost silly to even mention i just uh and, and maybe the MSPCA folks have, have a, a response to that, but. And I see Laura has her hand up as well. I think between Laura and Liz, um, yeah. Yeah, Laura, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I th I was thinking you're referring to our administrative assistant. Oh, sorry, uh, no, Laura from uh, the yeah. Society. Yeah. Okay, so who would like to speak first? Uh, I'll ask Laura to unmute, Laura Hagen. Hi there. Um, thank you so much. My name is Laura Hagan. I'm the director of captive wildlife for the Humane Society of the United States, and I'm a Massachusetts resident. Um, so just wanted to clarify two things. Number one, on the um, the higher education exemption, I, I believe uh, that was carried over from the Amherst language. Um, and the experience there was that Amherst was very concerned because of the inclusion of non-human primates, and they wanted to make sure that there wasn't any research implicated by the ordinance. And so that was why that language was included in Amherst. And then I think out of a, an abundance of caution, um, counselors, please sponsors, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that was just carried over out of an abundance of caution to make sure that uh, Smith, you know, would be covered if there was anything on this that might impact research, because that's not the intent of this. So just wanted to provide that historical clarification. And then on the residence language, um, the, usually these animals are not um, taken from, from the wild. These animals live in residence in other states. And so I think that that's what that's referring to is where they reside, which usually is out of state. They're usually housed um, in the off season in a stationary facility. And then when they're touring, they're you know kind of kept in a mobile traveling facility. So that is what the permanent residence uh, is referring to. Just to clear, just to clarify where that language kind of draws from. Okay, thank you for that. It, it makes sense to not um, give more credit than is is due if they don't actually live in a habitat. That makes sense to me. Yeah. Great. Uh, any other questions from counselors? Okay, so. Um, Great. So let's open it up to members of the public. So um, if you could use the reactions feature to raise your virtual hand. And if you're unable to do that, then um, you can also turn on your video and uh, raise your actual hand. Um, and uh, when you speak, please state your full name and your city or town of residence. Um, and if you could limit your comments to three minutes, that would be helpful so we can make sure that everyone can speak. <clears throat> uh, finally, uh, you know, you, we'll be taking comments. Uh, we'll, we'll go through everyone who wishes to speak and then we'll answer uh, the questions that have been raised. And um, Jim and Karen, do you feel comfortable compiling those questions as we go? And then, then you could address them. Okay, great. Uh, so the first person on the list is uh, Sarah Kate. Go ahead, Sarah. Hi, everyone. I'm Sarah Kate. I'm a resident of Northampton, 
And um, I've always been a big animal lover. I wasn't really familiar with this particular topic uh, until I heard about Amherst passing a similar ordinance. Um, so I reached out to my um, my then ward counselor, Karen Foster. I didn't move, but the wards moved. Uh, <laughs> um, and we've been working together for a while on this. And, um, uh, you know, I just thought it sounded like a a humane thing to do. I think of Northampton as a progressive city and a very compassionate city. And I thought that was in line with that. Um, and since learning about it, um, I've learned that the, the animals in these traveling acts, you know, it's, it's almost all in the title, like they're wild and they're traveling. Um, most animals don't do well with traveling, even, um, even farm animals. It's very stressful for them. Um, you know, with the exception of like domesticated animals, most dogs don't mind doing a lot of traveling, but uh, the traveling conditions can be really stressful for them. Um, and uh, the training is often um, involves cruelty, which is, is really surprising. Um, and that's something that like our local authorities wouldn't be able to um, regulate because the training often happens outside of Northampton, wherever these traveling acts um, are coming from. So um, I'm excited to uh, see it make it to this point and um, offering support for the ordinance. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Next is Rosalie Black. Hi, everyone. My name is Rosalie. Um, I grew up in Amherst, but now I live out in Chesterfield, but I own Wild Chestnut Cafe in Florence, um, which is a vegan cafe that took over the spot where Evolution was, um, Cafe Evolution. And uh, this topic and this ordinance is very important to me for many reasons. I have dedicated my life towards helping animals and liberating animals of all kinds. Um, the fact that this ordinance has such a massive list of so many different types of animals, like makes me so excited because we are definitely moving in that direction where cruelty and inhumane treatments of animals for any types of purposes, especially entertainment, is just becoming very not cool. <laughs> um, and I think a lot of people are making that connection between um, not only the entertainment that we have, but also the food that we eat. Um, so I met my business partner and friend, Missy, who is um, a co-owner of Wild Chestnut Cafe. We met doing vegan activism in the streets of Northampton. Um, so I'm very honored to be here. Uh, and I am just like so blown away that we have gotten to this point where people are kind of opening their eyes up to the fact that these traveling acts are, are not fun for the animals and they might be fun for the humans for a half a second, but as soon as the humans go home, the animals are still in cages. So um, I am all for this ordinance. I think that what is happening in Northampton and in Amherst is just like really beautiful that people are able to talk about these really difficult conversations about the way that we treat animals, which um, I don't think we've talked about a lot. So. Um, yeah, I, I'm very, um, really happy to hear all of this and I just, I wish you guys all the best because, um, I'm in full support. So, um, thank you for having me. Um, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, that's all I'd like to say. <laughs> hey, thank you, Rosalie. Uh, next is Richard Soda. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Hi, how are you guys doing? Good evening, City Council members. My name is Richard Soto, Richard Isaiah Soto. I come from Westfield, Massachusetts. I live here currently. Thank you for giving us the time to speak publicly on this matter. Um, I'm in opposition and I don't agree with the proposed ban because the state of Massachusetts already has very strict regulations on exotic animal ownership. When it comes to private entities doing educational or entertainment, entertainment functions, there isn't a concern about the use of crocodilians because they already cannot be kept in state without a permit. Legislative matters such as this can be a slippery slope when talking about exotic animals that people generally tend to misunderstand. It can open doors for potential amendments and additions to other species. The door we should be opening is a door to push further programs because animal programs are how people be, can become more educated on matters that can contribute to conservation of specific species and habitats. 
Seeing these animals in person is really a big eye opener that can spark a consciousness to care for and preserve specific species and ecosystems rather than unconsciously destroying it. I think this ordinance could uh, really impact how uh, the public, you know, could have the chance to, you know, spark a, a concern or care for what's going on with certain species and ecosystems. And uh, I'm just going through my uh, notes here. And I also had a question about uh, the pig racing. Um, I didn't really catch that in the in the um, in the ordinance, but I'm glad that was brought up uh, by Stan Moulton. Um, it doesn't really make sense to me that every the the concern here is um, animal cruelty and pig racing is okay because we don't you know we don't race anything like we don't race greyhounds anymore. So I don't see how racing pigs is uh, okay, but. Yeah, there seems to be some gray areas in the ordinance and uh, I'd like to see that really taken care of if anything, but uh, I'm in opposition and do not agree with this. And I hope some of you are too. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. Next is Jeremy Turgeon. All right, can you guys hear me? Oh, yes, Fantastic. we can, go ahead. Fantastic. Uh, Good evening, guys. My name is Jeremy Turgeon. Um, I'm a former resident of Springfield, Massachusetts. Um, I currently reside in North Carolina, but uh, stay pretty active in Massachusetts uh, and see what's going on with uh, animal regulations and stuff. Um, I'm speaking similarly to Richie with a lot of focus on the reptile side of this. Um, obviously, crocodilians being on the list was uh, a little concerning via redundancy with state regulations that are already in place. Um, as it stands in Massachusetts, uh, there's no way for you to get a permit for a crocodilian unless you are like a super high ranking facility. Um, so there's really not much of a concern for crocodilians to be added uh, to this list in my opinion. Um, a little bit more background on me, just this makes a little bit more sense. Um, I've been keeping reptiles and amphibians for the last 24 years. Um, I've managed some of the largest reptile breeding facilities on the East Coast. Um, over the years, I have uh, worked with Mass Fish and Wildlife, um, Springfield MSPCA on various cases regarding uh, animal abuse and neglect uh, with a focus on reptiles, obviously. Um, <clears throat> I have uh, seen some of the worst of the worst. And I would certainly like to commend uh, the committee for bringing this up in the first place because I feel like it comes from a very good place. Um, and obviously as I've heard from some people who are in support of this, you know, they're talking about, we're talking about the inhumane treatment of larger animals, especially larger mammals, marsupials and things like that. So I believe this comes from a good place, but uh, I've also worked on legislative matters where we see something simple like this be proposed and passed and five or six years down the line, it comes back up and there's a more common species of animal uh, that might be kept in the private sector uh, that gets added to this list. And I know it was brought up, you know, about uh, programs going into schools that might have like snakes and lizards and stuff, but those are kind of off limits uh, according to how the ordinance is written currently. Um, but there's a concern that they could be added at a later point in time. Um, so I would like to see the committee potentially go back to the drawing board on this and, uh, and look at things a little bit more. Uh, my last point will be uh, the zoo and forest park um, exemption section. Uh, I don't think made clear for, um, for the zoo and forest park to be able to do their uh, zoo to you or zoo on the go programs, um, which in certain instances might include a marsupial like the native Virginia possum. Um, so I want to uh, just ask the, the committee to take some more time and go through this. As, from what I'm hearing, it also sounds like there was some clarification within the committee that needed to be double checked. Um, and I think it would be wise to just take a little bit more time to make sure that that's gone through appropriately. Great, thank you, Jeremy. Uh, is there anyone else from the public who would like to speak to raise your virtual hand or your physical hand on your video? Okay, seeing none. Um, if Jim and Karen, would you like to respond to some of the points that were raised? Well, it, also, if we've missed anything, <laughs> feel free to 
feel free to mention it. So I, I heard concern about, uh, first of all, that um, that this proposal that that basically Massachusetts state law already protects. Uh, there's plenty of protections out there, and that um, and. Yeah, and one of the things we did review was, you know, mass general law around the prote uh, protections that are in place, and um, and some of the systems that um, that go into effect when there's a report. So typically, something you know, like if somebody's um, witnessing some sort of abuse of an animal, whether it be domestic or or a wild animal, it gets reported to uh, the police. Then the police is working. In uh, we'll reach out to the MSPCA, and um, that that those that starts the the system of trying to figure out whether or not um, you know a prosecution is needed, and and what kind of uh, steps are needed to be taken to uh, care for the the animal in question. Um, but the thing is, in in instances like that, that we're talking about. Um, a specific event, and what what we're aiming at here is to to kind of um, uh, get in front of the idea of a, an event like that needing to happen for a wild animal. So if there is if there isn't a traveling show for um, for a tiger or a bear or something like that, um, if there's not a place for you know that entertainment to occur, then you're, it's actually preventing that event of some of of that animal being trained. So it's actually it works in conjunction with those protections. And so um, that's so that was one of the the things that I heard. Uh, and um, Karen, did I cover that one pretty well? Or feel yes. free to embellish. Um, and <laughs> no, that that's um, you know that that's I, th I think you did a great job with that one, Jim. The um, let's see uh, that um, I believe it was Jeremy Turgeon who mentioned uh, the possum, um, and and again um, we are not um, ruling out this doesn't rule out the idea that um, that. For example, kids could travel down to Arcadia, or and that there could be a a possum that's rehabbing, um, or that for some reason grew up in captivity and can't be released to the wild. That that could be part of some educational program. Um, what what we're, we're what this is preventing is is the breeding of a possum to be part of some ongoing um, traveling show. Um, this, you know, that if there were a possum up at Look Park, um, at the uh, the facility up there, it, it, it would be fine because they're rehabbing the animal. So um, I, I think it's, uh, Karen, you wanna add anything to that? Um. No, I, I had one other one other thing I wanted to address, but carry on, Jim. Well, no, it's so if I'm missing anything. And then there was the concern about uh, so programs around um, uh, reptiles going into schools. Um, and again, like we've outlined in within the language that if it's a legitimate educational um, program, that is geared to going into schools to teach children about specific animals, then, you know, that is okay. So, um, and Karen, you had an, another point you wanted to address? Just um, two, two others that weren't quite as specific, but they're the, the concern about um, limiting opportunities for education and conservation by, um, you know, through this ordinance that, that it may actually reduce people's um, desire for conservation is, is you know, that it's, um, 
It's an argument that we hear, and as I mentioned at the beginning, is an argument that people often use to justify um, you know, these types of acts, um, which do put the animals used for them in a very stressful state through the travel and the training and all of that. And um, you know, I, I believe in conservation and you know, I have kids myself who I want to learn about the world and about animals, but there's lots of ways they can do that that don't involve um, a non-native wild animal um, traveling to Northampton out of its out of its habitat. Um, you know, it's a very uh, it's it's cruel for the animals, and um, as much as we all want to support that kind of um, op educational opportunity, there's ways we can do that. And as we've mentioned, the sort of bona fide um, educational programming for kids aren't impacted by this ordinance. It's it's entertainment, which can be conflated with education. Liz, did you want to jump in? I, I know we had an in-depth discussion about the um, mass general laws too. Yeah, sure. Um, happy to. And I uh, want to be sure to try to respond to um, all the points that were raised. So if I forget anything, um, please let me know. Um, so yes, I think you got it. You, uh, the sponsors covered the issue around um, the state law well. So there is chapter 272, chapter 272, section 77, which is an anti-cruelty law. Um, that said, with these kinds of traveling acts, much of the abuse happens behind the scenes and or out of state. Um, it's difficult and unusual to catch violations of this law in the act um, here in Massachusetts. And, um, and also what might appear cruel or abusive to some folks, to us, might not rise to the level of cruelty under that statute. And so as um, I think it was Councillor Nash was saying, this ordinance addresses a very specific issue and would sure ensure that traveling shows using these kinds of exotic animals would not, would never be coming into Northampton to perform. Um, I also wanted to make sure to address some other points here. So um, on the question of education, just to kind of echo what um, Councillor Foster said, you know, I agree. I, I don't think that there's educational um, value in seeing, you know, a, an exotic animal come to Northampton and perform. I think that actually presents sort of a um, distorted view and an exploitative view of animals and sends a message that it's okay to remove them from their native habitat, lug them around the country, um, and teach them how to do tricks that we happen to find funny, um, and that they're there for our entertainment. And I don't think that that helps kids, oops, my lights went off, helps kids um, learn to respect animals or to uh, value conservation. And um, as Councillor Foster said, I think there are lots of other valuable ways to do that. Even just things like wildlife watching of our own native, native wildlife can be incredibly informative and fascinating and impart to kids that animals are important parts of our ecosystem and they're all interesting um, and they all you know add something different. Um, relatedly there actually have been some studies on this question around zoos though and um, there hasn't been any um, educational value identified there as a, there's no link that's been identified at least not yet. Um, a question around the alligators came up um, that the crocodilia are covered in the ordinance. So I, I think it's important to not conflate two different things. Um, so I, I think the speaker was talking about permits for private ownership of um, certain crocodilia. And again, so this ordinance is about prohibiting a traveling show from coming into Northampton and using a crocodile as part of its um, entertainment exhibit. So that's that's a, a different thing. Um, I know a, a point around racing greyhounds was brought up. Um, I think it's comparing apples to oranges to, um, to try to say uh, that it's illogical to be opposed to racing greyhounds and yet um, not cover racing pigs in this ordinance. Um, the experiences of those animals are extremely different. Um, greyhounds are, you know, 
bred and raised and trained to race as fast as possible. It's very bad for their bodies and that's their life. Um, and you add on top of that confinement. And um, with, you know, racing pigs, it, they're pigs. And then every once in a while they run around a track. Uh, it's very different. Um, and a concern was mentioned about more animals being added to the list. Uh, we're not aware of any um, case where additional species have been added after this list passed. Um, and again, this list was put together very thoughtfully. And the reason these are the animals that are included are because they're the ones most commonly used in these kinds of shows. They're the ones who suffer the most and they're the ones who put the public uh, most at risk. And that's in terms of physical injury and also at risk of transmitting zoonotic diseases. And this particular list of covered species has been adopted in the um, many of the other ordinances and bylaws passed in other municipalities in Massachusetts, especially in recent years. And uh, those communities have found it to be a, a perfectly appropriate list. Um, let me just scan my list here and make sure I haven't missed anything I wanted to touch on. I, I don't, uh, that's, I wanted to respond to everything. I think maybe I covered it all between myself and the counselors. Um, was there anything that I missed that um, you feel I should talk about? I didn't hear anything. Thank you. Thanks. Questions from council? Jim. Yeah, I just want to thank everybody for sharing tonight. Uh, this has been a that uh, this continues to be a really great conversation. Uh, that that when Councillor Foster approached me, with Karen approached me with this, oh, I, what was it, a year and a half ago, two years ago, and that we've been working on this, and that I have to say that this is all new stuff to me, and that. Um, and I really appreciate all of the questions raised by both members of the public and by counselors tonight as, as I'm like, oh yeah, let's see, how does that play? Because <laughs> this is all very new to me at least. So um, I just want to thank everybody. Great, thank you, Jim and Karen for bringing this forward. Um, Shall we move on to, if we're ready to move on to a deliberation, then uh, I would entertain a motion on a recommendation. I would uh, move to uh, recommend back to full council with a positive recommendation. I'll second. Motion made by Marissa Elkins and seconded by Stan Moulton. Uh, discussion. Stan. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I want to thank first Sarah for bringing this uh, to uh, Karen Foster's attention some months ago. And uh, uh, Sarah, you, you understand that sometimes local government uh, works uh, slowly, but we're at a point now where I think we're going to take a very uh, meaningful step to meet the concern that you uh, that you brought forward. And I also want to thank Jim and, and Karen for the, the work they put into this, and particularly to address uh, the fairgrounds, for one, which uh, is a very important part of our of our community, and uh, the the um, the agricultural uh, component, the 4-H exhibits uh, that all would not be affected by this. Making sure that they are are going to be uh, going to be uh, still part of the uh, the three county fair and uh, uh, and other events at the fairgrounds. Um, and I think that the questions that have been raised about educational components uh, uh, have been satisfactorily answered that those will also legitimate education will not be affected by this. This is targeted at something which I think we recognize now it's well documented the cruelty to animals in taken out of their natural habitat in captivity traveling around for entertainment of, of of people uh that cruelty in both in the training and the travel and the shows has been very well documented and i'm very very happy that uh, that northampton appears to be uh on the verge of joining other communities like amherst in uh in, in prohibiting that. That's why I'm supporting this. Marissa. 
Um, yes, I want to thank the sponsors for bringing this forward and for working so hard on it. Um, I've certainly uh, received all the, the many emails, but they all pretty much boiled down to the same thing um, and, and the same points, which I think were also reiterated here tonight. Um, I think this is a, it, particularly um, important, and uh, I think Northampton has a particular because of the fairgrounds and because of that as a as a venue um, has a particularly important role to play um, by this. I think there are a lot of communities that could pass this in a way that would be kind of symbolic, but it's meaningful here um, be specifically because of the fairgrounds and and the opportunities it presents as a venue. Um, I have to offer that I found um, a number of the points against unpersuasive, um, and, and I don't want to dwell on them too much, but I do want to, the intersection of this meaningful thing that, that Northampton can do to take away a market, to take away a venue for this kind of show, and what it means for, um, for situations um, where these animals are being raised and um and held under circumstances that that may be not just cruel in in terms of how um what people think about traveling and being held in captivity but also actually cruel under whatever statutes of the jurisdiction that they're they're living in residing in to use the word um is important and unique and it actually i i was I found it very much not the case that the that the the state cruelty statute really reached this. Um, as uh, Liz said um, and offered, you know, the cruelty that happens to these animals, um, sort of ab above and beyond what we think about the sort of traveling and being in captivity and where they appear to be fed or they appear to be, you know, whatever. The that happens out of state. And it, it's not at all clear to me that any of these um, that 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 the the MSPCA and the local authorities will be able to act. The other thing too is that when if a traveling show comes here and an instance of cruelty is seen and identified, it then opens up a whole other enforcement issue for the MSPCA and the enforcements, which is what do they do with those animals if they have to come in and take them? Now they're taking in animals um, that. Um, are, you know, aren't meant to be kept, kept in captivity. The better thing to do is to take away a venue, to take away a market. Um, and so I find this very compelling um, and uh, very compelling and that we're in a unique situation as a community to do something that's um, enforceable and meaningful um, that I has an impact well beyond Northampton. So I'm happy to to support it and um, uh, and and very pleased with the work, uh, Councilors Nash. Uh, sorry, we're in committee meeting uh, <laughs> that Karen and Jim have have done on it, and and with the partners that they worked with um, in the in the community and SPCA and and so forth. So I happily will support this. Great, I'll go ahead and weigh in. Um, I'm a, I'm also uh, going to support this, and um, I appreciate the the targeted list and and the reaching out that that you all have done with the stakeholders to identify any concerns. Um, and I think it's a, there are, the exceptions are appropriate. So um, I'm happy to, to move forward with it. Any other discussion? Okay, Laura. Oh, uh, we have a, a technical issue to figure out. And that is um, where this will be located in the code of ordinances. So um, as attorney Seewald has uh, sent us a, a, he sees two possible solutions. Uh, we could include, so the, the place where it's currently uh, set to be is already occupied by another ordinance. So we could um, have it be that number and then make all the numbers beyond that. There are some 12, 13, uh, move all of those up one number, changing those numbers. Uh, or we could add a separate article, Article 4, the use of wild and exotic animals for entertainment, and put the ordinance there as 128-21. Uh, um, so I don't know if the sponsors have any input uh, on this particular technical issue as far as where it should be located in the Code of Ordinances. I could see a concern when, when you do a bunch of renumbering 
if there are any references to that, then you've changed the number. Um, so with that, that, that would be, that would push me in the direction of actually just adding another uh, article and, and putting it at the end. Um, but I would be happy to hear from others on that. I'll just jump in to, to second what you said, Alex. Um, I think it it I don't I don't have a strong attachment either way, but um, creating a new article for it to live makes a lot of sense to me, um, particularly that issue of cross-referencing um, because we could inadvertently uh, challenge or make void a different ordinance or or have some reference not work out in the future. And um, it, it seems like a, an elegant solution to create a new article. Great. And Laura, do you know that there isn't anything else under 120 chapter, is it chapter or section 128? If, if we 128 move, we... eight is actually um, dog licensing. So it actually, there may well be some cross references in um, notices to the public, I'm thinking, or even website for um, licensing processes. So that is a possibility. I see, um, it, but the 128-21, there's no, that wouldn't be any, if we added it there instead at the end, oh. uh, that wouldn't be, that wouldn't conflict with anything else, correct? No, it wouldn't. Okay. Um, well, would anyone like to make a motion to amend, uh, to add, um, Article four, the use of wild and exotic animals for entertainment, uh, and then insert this ordinance as 128-21. So moved. Second. Okay, motion made by Marissa Elkins and seconded by Ben Nash. Any discussion on that amendment? And is that, a, is that all, do you feel clear, Laura, about what we're, uh, I believe so, but are you also suggesting making it Article Four, um, a yes. separate article? Also, yes. Okay. Yes, Article Four. And then four. just the number would be one twenty-eight twenty-one. Got it. Yes. Okay. Seeing no further. So, yes. Just a quick. So, and Laura, this all works for you, right? This makes sense and isn't creating a headache. No, it makes sense. Yeah, because Laura and I were talking earlier, like she'd have to change all the numbers of mm. following, but all right, all right. then I'm yeah. good. With it. <laughs> and if there's any issue in between, you know, we still have this at council. So if there's any issue that comes up in the next few days. Um, so seeing no further discussion on that amendment, uh, roll call on that amendment. Councillor Elkins. Yes. Councillor Moulton. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Any further discussion on a positive recommendation on this ordinance as a whole? Seeing none, roll call, please. Councillor Moulton. Yes. yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. And Councillor Elkins. Yes. Okay, that moves forward with a positive recommendation unanimously. Uh, so thank you, Karen. Thank you so much. And we will move on to 21.175, an ordinance relative to parking on Stoddard Street. And I propose that we, um, since these are related, we also take up at the same time 22.176, an ordinance relative to parking on Prospect Street. And these were both referred to us by the city council uh, on October 6th, and they were both recommended by the Transportation and Parking Commission. And uh, we don't have um, Director Lascalia with us who would normally speak to this matter. Um, Councilor M M uh, Stan, <laughs> would you, uh, are you, it, you're familiar with this, this is in Ward 1, and um, would you be up for introducing this? And uh, Laura, would it be possible, I, I know you can't show your video, but are you, are you able to share your screen? Um, I will and certainly try. So the maps. Uh, sure. This ordin these ordinances. Let me try. Let's see. Um, yes. 
Whoops. Oh, there we go. Um, and you see the Stoddard Street. Is it more helpful to have the Stoddard Street or the one for Prospect? Uh, St Stoddard. Uh, okay. For uh, first, Laura, thank you. So um, this is, uh, as uh, as Alex said, um, it's not just Ward One; it's my neighborhood, uh, and it's one street over from me. So I am very familiar with the uh, conditions uh, on both Stoddard and Prospect Street. Um, uh, the uh, the effort on Stoddard started before I took office. Uh, about, I, I would guess, summer of 2021, concerns raised by residents because there, uh, th there is no um, prohibition of parking on Stoddard. There are vehicles often that are parked on both sides. There was concern about, uh, it's a fairly narrow street, about emergency vehicles uh, uh, having uh, access uh, in, in the case where there are uh, vehicles on, on both sides of the street. So that conversation began and uh, ultimately uh, went to transportation and parking uh, with the recommendation of the uh, DPW for um, for the alternating no parking on um, on uh, on on uh, both sides of, uh, of of Stoddard. This is something that uh, uh, that Jim is very, very fond of, and uh, uh, he can speak more, uh, more uh, thoroughly than I can about the benefits of that. But I believe that the uh, residents of Stoddard Street feel that th this would address their concern about making sure that emergency vehicles can get down Stoddard and also would prevent, uh, uh, in the case of, of no parking on one side of the street, that I guess tends to allow for the possibility of of, of speeding because of the chute that you can, uh, you know, you can drive uh, right 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 up the that side of the street. Um, this this has I don't see anybody from Stoddard who is is uh, uh, in this meeting, but my understanding is from working with. Uh, residents over the course of this year that they have taken this to everybody on the street and uh, I am not aware that anyone is opposed to this uh, to this arrangement. Uh, Jim, do you want to just speak to the to the uh, to the alternating no parking and why um, in your experience you found that this is a good solution? Yeah, so this is an idea that I've had kicking around for a few years and um, and uh, DPW and the TPC took me up on it, which is, um, you know, that uh, what a, a concept for rebuilding streets to slow traffic is to create a chicane where you take the travel lanes and you just kind of shift them. And what what I saw with a lot of our city streets, especially in the older parts of the city where the streets are narrow, we we can we can tr create a chicane with the parking zones, and um, and I saw the opportunity here of rather than having one long uh, uh, straightaway where you have the parking on one side of the street, that we can alternate it, create two different parking zones so that it, as somebody's tra traveling down the street, they're going to look halfway down the street and they're going to say, hold it, there's a car in the way and I really can't see completely through. And that um, and that the effect is it, 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 it encourages people to drive more cautiously. And so I look at this as a grand experiment <laughs> for us around... Uh, creating such parking zones in other places in, in the city to just naturally use the parking zones to, you know, calm the traffic down. And um, it, it, that, it, um, that it doesn't cost a lot of money other than where we put the parking signs and that we don't have to rebuild the street. And um, I, I'm very interested to see how this plays out. So anyway. I'm really glad that the TPC took me up on my idea. So, okay, thanks, 
Jim, that's great. Um, so the uh, the the uh, related uh, no parking on uh, Prospect uh, arose during the discussion uh, between Stoddard residents and uh, and the DPW and the TPC. Uh, this would uh, improve the sight line for uh, vehicles um, uh, entering Prospect from Stoddard by uh, 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 by uh, uh, a, 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 a small uh, addition or small exclusion of parking uh, on the uh, on the northeast side of uh, of Prospect Street. And I, I will uh, will will say I, I certainly don't. Uh, uh, I think that this is a great idea. Uh, it, it, it's, it's something that's needed from Stoddard, but I've also heard from my constituents on, uh, on Perkins, on Winter, on uh, Prospect Court, uh, that, that uh, similar, um, they have similar problems uh, getting out onto, onto, Stoddard, onto uh, Prospect Street. And I can certainly say from someone who's, you know, uh, lived on Perkins for more than 40 years that that's that's the case so I would like to uh, and I suggested to all of them that in addition to speaking uh, t tonight and I know Linda uh, is, is, wants to, wants to speak to this issue that they also request uh, a, a, an additional look at uh, 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 at the at the intersections uh, that I've just mentioned from the other cross streets but certainly uh, this is this specific one that we're considering tonight is supported by residents of, of Stoddard Street and I, I I support it as well. Great, thank you, Stan. Does um, anyone know, you know, there, there's a no, no parking is allowed within a certain distance of every intersection. Does anyone happen to know what that, that is? We'll have, we I believe it's 20 feet. Okay. So as and compared. it is from, it's also measured from the, you know, the, the point of the angle. So often the streets bend like that, you know, that the curb will bend. So it's actually from this point. So. Uh -huh. Okay. Right. So this certainly, you know, in this case, um, it's 65 feet that they are that is no parking zone. So it's, it's adding a, a considerable amount. Um, I'm just curious to make sure that that, that is being enforced, that the, the 20 feet is being enforced and that that's clear. Um, so that, that that may address some of the concerns uh, at the other intersections. Well, that's the key, Alex, enforcement. And, and I, I will tell you as a, a frequent traveler on the Prospect Street that it's not being enforced, so. Mm -hmm. That, that's something that needs to be addressed as, as, as well. Right. Uh, I wanted to ask, uh, Linda, were you wanting to speak uh, to this item? I think you were going to speak about State Street and Stoddard. Hi. Um, yes. Yeah, so um, Linda, could I, you state your name and your uh, um, Linda and I live on. Um, the corner of State and Perkins. Perkins is where my driveway is. Okay. So I often go up Perkins to get on to Prospect Street to go into Florence, to go to the hospital for appointments or whatever. And I can tell you it's almost impossible to see any cars coming around the bend from Finn Street onto Prospect Street they are going quickly and it's hard to see. And at first I thought it was because I'm a short person, but my husband also has problems and he's a tall person. It is just the way that the Prospect Street is angled there and the curve and cars coming around. And I mentioned to Stan, the other issue for us for sure is the top of Perkins Avenue is very icy in the winter time. We don't get sun there. So it's also not only are you up on the top of Perkins trying to see, you're also on some ice. It's almost impossible. Um, I am always amazed uh, that there are not more accidents in that area than there are. Uh, 
So, and when I heard this 20 foot thing, I thought, wait a minute, there are cars parked right to the edge of the street. You know, you can see them as, you know, it's only a few feet from Perkins Avenue that there are, maybe they consider intersections to be where it's four, you know, you can see four things. It's only Perkins Avenue going on to Prospect. It's just one street coming on to it. Um, I was interested in Stoddard Street because that's my safety net. If I can't get out of, of Perkins Avenue, I will back up and go around to try to get out of Stoddard Street, which is much easier because it's a little level there. Right. Um, you know, I didn't realize that. And I agree with Stan. I don't see a lot of enforcement. And it is a tiny neighborhood. You know, these houses are close together. We're the old part of town. The houses are close. There's not a lot of off street parking in some of these places because they're so old. So it is difficult, but um, I certainly would say if you're going to put it on Stoddard, if you're gonna to put to the left of Stoddard Street that there can't be parking for so many feet, it also should be definitely the left of the other streets which are closer to the bend around Finn Street. Great, thank you. Linda. Thank you. Yeah, Thanks. we we aren't able to um, amend this uh, now. It would be beyond the scope of what we're discussing. But I think you know whether I'm hearing from Stan that that he is very interested in in looking at these other intersections, and we'll we'll uh, be be looking at that. So thank you. Uh, other discussion, Jim. Yeah, I, I want to add that um, for Linda, the, the way to start that process around um, Perkins is to uh, pull up the uh, parking change request form. It's on the DPW website and, um, and that, it, that will get the process going. And, um, um, and you know, I, I would CC uh, your counselor, uh, Stan, uh, uh, that you're that you've sent the form in, and that uh, DPW will uh, uh, keep Stan part of the process as that uh, moves forward. DPW needs to, um, you know, go out and check out the site, do measurements, and and assess what the issue is, and then um, should they find reason based on and based on what you're saying, there's there's likelihood they'll consider that because, you know, Prospect Street is uh, one of the big uh, connecting um, thoroughfares in the city um, that people do travel a little bit faster on that than on the side streets. It's all to say that a request for better sight lines as you're pulling into that street, that, that's, that's a possibility, but it starts with making that, um, that filling out that reform or that form. Any other discussion? Um, actually, oh, Linda would like to respond to that. Hang on. Okay, go ahead, Linda. Yeah, um, Stan actually, Stan is wonderful. And he actually told me about that form and I did it today. Oh. So that's been done. There was no place on the form to CC your counselor to your ward person. But just, I, I, I'm, I, I'm aware, Linda, that you filed that form. Thank right. you. Thank you, thanks. Great, the wheels are moving. <laughs> um, so I uh, would we'll be looking for a recommendation uh, on both of these ordinances if we are ready for that. Stan? Recommend we send them on to the council with a positive recommendation. Second. Uh, the motion for a positive recommendation was made by Stan Moulton and seconded by Marissa Elkins. Any further discussion on these? Seeing none, a roll call, please. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Elkins. Yes. yes. And Councillor Moulton. Yes. Okay, that passes unanimously with positive recommendation. Um, I don't, unless there is any new business, I, which I don't see, we are ready for to adjourn. So for a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Second. Roll call, please. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Elkins. 
Yes. Councillor Moulton. Yes. And Councillor Nash. Yes. All right, we are adjourned. <laughs>